I don't know, I'm just excited. Whenever you study the Bible, and, and this book especially, uh, the, the presence of God is here. The presence of God is with you. The lovely Jesus is with you, and his holy angels are all around you. He loves you. He died for you on the cross of Calvary and shed his precious blood just for you. He has a whole heaven full of blessings for those who love and obey him. So let's turn now in our Bible to the book of Revelation, chapter 3, and we're going to pick up where we left off. We're in Revelation 3, and we are uh, in the talking about the church of Laodicea, which happens to be us living today. And it's not a wonderful picture that God gives, is it? Uh, the church before that, Philadelphia, God didn't have one bad thing to say about Philadelphia. He doesn't have one good thing to say about Laodicea. And uh, so, but he gives us hope. Aren't you glad? God always gives us hope. Hope for the future. Hope for now. Hope in Jesus. Here, Revelation 3.14, uh, it says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. The word in Greek there for beginning really means the one who began it, the beginner of the creation of God. In other words, Jesus created and began creating the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. Why? Because if you're cold or hot, you're in a better condition than what we're in now. It says, so then because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. A person that's hot is on fire for God. A person that's cold, is like the poor sinner who knows he's a sinner and he feels some need. The person that's lukewarm professes to be a Christian, a follower, a church member, and he knows he's going to heaven and he's just floating along and he is neither cold or hot and he does not know his need. He thinks he's, uh, verse 17 says, because thou sayest, I am rich. In other words, he thinks he's rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing. But rich in what? Rich in spiritual uh, knowledge. And Laodiceans are rich in spiritual knowledge. We know more about the Bible than um, uh, people, uh, any other denomination in the whole world. I just saw an article in the paper yesterday about Harold Camping. Have you ever heard of Harold Camping? Yes. You've heard of him? Yes. He made a prediction that in 1994 Jesus was going to come. That helped to make him more humble, uh, if you know what I mean. Uh, but he still has a great following of uh, people all over the world, really. And uh, he has a great knowledge of the Bible. Uh, uh, lately, uh, the paper said that he's been saying that the church age is over. And uh, he's been telling people that uh, to come out of all the churches and worship in homes. Yes. This has been making all the preachers very angry at Howard, uh, Harold Camping and uh, uh, because they don't want people to quit going to their churches and worship in homes. They want them in their churches. And uh, so that was an interesting thing. Uh, he is not telling people that the churches are babbling to come out of them, but uh, the effect is the same as if he were. Nevertheless, uh, he's 81 years old, and uh, uh, this this thing about his prediction of Christ coming in 1994 uh, was unfortunate, but it helped him to be more humble. But yet, if he's faithful, God can use him, and I pray that he will accept God's Sabbath. I believe he's been fighting against the Sabbath on the air, but pray, yes, would you? Second. Second Sunday Adventist, I'm, oh boy, pray for him. Yes, pray my, for him. My pastor prayed, he preached that same, same way. Pray for him. Yes, and let's do that. Okay, because God loves him, but, but anyway, he says, I word that thou wert rich, hot, or cold. Because you're neither hot nor cold, I will spew thee out of my mouth. 
You know, we need to be humble, isn't that right? Amen. And God knows how to humble us. God's prophet tells us, humble yourself so that God does not have to humble you. Because if God does it, does he really know how to do it good? Yes, yes he knows yes. how to do it very, very well. But when he does it, it's with a heart of love. And um, But it says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Um, uh, you know, but when you fall into his hands, he has mercy as well as justice. Yes. And I'm thankful for that. Sometimes his justice has to come out and uh, very strong to help wake a person up. Yes. And like the Apostle Paul had to be knocked down on the ground and yes. blinded. Uh, don't have that happen to you. Humble your own self. It says, before the mighty hand of God, and he will lift you up. The Laodiceans are quite proud, and they feel that they don't need anything. But I thank the Lord you don't have to stay that way. You can be an exception. There are exceptions, like there are Enochs living right now. You can be one of those. Isn't that wonderful? You can be as close to Jesus as you want to be. Isn't that amazing, an amazing thought? You can be as close to Jesus as you want to be. Nobody can keep you away if he won't keep you away. You can be like Enoch if you want, filling your mind with the Word of God instead of the television set, instead of the computer all the time, the Internet, instead of a million other things. Read, study the Word of God. It's so vital. And uh, so he says, I counsel thee, verse 18, to buy of me gold tried in the fire. What is that gold made out of? Faith and love, that gold, and notice it's tried where? In the fire, what does that mean? It's persecution, trials, hardships. That's why a lot of people don't want that gold. They don't want the faith and love because it comes with the fire. But you must have that or you'll be lost. Um, uh, it's, and believe me, when you get that love tried in the fire, you're never sorry, believe me, because... Uh, when you get that faith and love, what does the fire feel like? Well, it feels, and it, how much does it hurt you? It hurts you just as much as it hurt Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. And in the book Pilgrim's Progress, uh, Pilgrim had to have this fire uh, seal him in his forehead, and he drew back. He said, oh, I don't know if I want that. But the... Uh, angel told him, unless you have this, you can't go on. You can't go to the celestial city. You're doomed. You're lost. And so finally he said, all right. And he braced himself for this horrible pain that was going to shoot through his head. And the angel put this fiery thing upon his forehead and said, that's all. It's over. <laughs> he said, well, I didn't feel anything. And the angel said, well, you see, Jesus took the pain. Yeah. on the cross of Calvary. Yeah. He said, well, if I'd have known that, I wouldn't have hesitated. The angel said, well, if you had have known that, it would not have been a test. He said, another test. He said, why are we tested so much? The angel said, because the devil is constantly accusing God's people of all these sins that they're filled with. And so God is constantly testing them to show the devil and the universe that by His grace they're overcoming these sins and meeting these tests. It's all to rebuke the devil and prove the devil a liar. Have you ever thought of it that way? Isn't that something? So by your own test, you are vindicating God and proving the devil a liar by clinging to Jesus through your test. And the devil's been accusing you. Do you believe that? He's been accusing you to God and to the angels and to the whole universe. So God brings you a test. He brings us fire. And you're clinging to Jesus, claiming his promises. And you meet that test. And Jesus says, see, devil, see, universe. The devil's accusations against him are false. Look, look at this test. That he clung to me and I gave him victory. So that's what tests do. One thing it develops our character, but another thing, it vindicates God. So isn't that wonderful? So uh, uh, the angel said, it's over. Well, he said, I didn't feel anything. Uh, if I'd have known that, I wouldn't have hesitated. He said, if you'd have known that, it wouldn't have been a test. You met that test, and it vindicated God's character. 
Uh, praise the Lord. And so the goal tried in the fire. Uh, don't hesitate. <laughs> don't hesitate. Welcome that fire and welcome that goal, which is faith and love. And you'll, boy, will you be glad. Just like Pilgrim or the Christian was glad after he got that fire. And, and he said Jesus took the pain on the cross. And uh, it doesn't mean there's no pain in tests and suffering, but Jesus has taken the great pain. Whatever you suffer really is nothing at all compared to that. Uh, now, he says, counsel uh, gold tried in the fire to be rich, also white raiment. That's the white raiment of Christ's righteousness, not your own. You're constantly receiving from him as a free gift of grace. And I said that thou might see clearly between right and wrong. That's the Holy Spirit. And uh, now let's look at this gold for a minute, tried in the fire. This gold, it's made out of faith and love. Can you have love without faith? No. Can you have faith without love? No. It says faith works by love and purifies the soul. Uh, and I found that when the love of God is wells up in your heart, you do trust Him and you do have faith. Uh, uh, here, let's look at this love. Let's turn to this chapter. Is there a chapter in the Bible that talks about love? 1 Corinthians 13. That's right, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So turn to that. And I'm going to use the word love in there instead of the word charity, but it means the love of God that comes from God in our hearts. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, <coughs> And have not love, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Though I speak all the language in the world without love, it's totally worthless because it would all be selfish for show. Verse 2, though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. Love suffereth what? Long. Uh, it's not only meaning suffering long of your own suffering, it means the word long suffering. What does that word mean? Long suffering means another word for it is what? Patience. Love suffers long and has great patience, uh, especially with other people, with others. It has great patience. It suffers long uh, with the mistakes of others, but not with their vices. Did you catch that? Love suffers long with their mistakes, but not with their vices. The prophet told us, when you have a husband or a wife, suffer long with their mistakes. Don't just uh, correct them immediately after every mistake. If you do, you're in trouble. You are in trouble. If you correct them instantly for every mistake, you will drive them away. Believe me, real fact. The prophet says, suffer long with their mistakes, but not with their vices. That means uh, God will give you wisdom to handle their mistakes. You don't always even point them out. Like it says in Desire of Ages, Jesus rarely, hardly ever, corrected his brothers in his home that were very ungodly, uh, it appears, and they rejected Christ. He rarely ever, ever corrected them, ever. And that he was God. But it says he had a word from God to speak to them in cheerfulness. Uh, so he bore long with their mistakes. This is something that you plan, you know it's wrong, you're planning to do it, you're going to do it, that is a vice. A mistake is far different. You bear long with those and you don't even tell the person about them all the time. Because I know of a couple that one of the uh, spouses thought that he or she had to correct their spouse every time they made a mistake. That marriage is in trouble, big trouble, constantly, constantly. I'm trying to teach that person, don't do that. You're driving that person away. Uh, bear long. So it says, love suffers long. And God will give you wisdom to 
to uh, later on, after, you know, when a person is doing wrong and they're reproved from it, it's tremendously humiliating and guilt is tremendously powerful and the devil is there to make them discouraged and overwhelm them. And so for somebody to constantly be doing that is breaking the law of human ease. In those seven secrets of family happiness, number three and four is choice and humility. I go through that in the soul winning school. Uh, that law number three is violated, broken, when the person does that all the time and is the person, other person, it, it actually withers away the tender plant of love and it makes the person want to get away. Get away from that person. And you can't blame them. It just withers that love right away. And the person thinks he's doing right, or he, she are doing right, by constantly correcting them, but they're really doing wrong. Violating the law that they're trying to, and they don't understand what's wrong. Why is this person not warm toward me anymore? Why is he staying away from me? They don't realize what they're doing. And so this is why it says, love suffers long, and is what? Kind. And love suffers long and is kind. Uh, God will give special wisdom to all men and women to know just, and, and, and parents too with their children, because it will drive a child away. We all need special wisdom just to know how to deal with the mistakes of others, and as well as our own mistakes too, isn't that right? Oh yes. Uh, love suffers long and is kind. Charity, charity envieth not. Want is not itself. You know, some of the greatest men in history have been uh, have died in obscurity, in humility. Uh, I saw a program of 100 people that have affected the entire world the most in the past 1,000 years, and it started with person 100 and came right on down, and all these great scientists and discoverers and explorers and great people. 100 people of the last 1,000 years were shown until finally got to person number one who they believe has affected the entire world the most in the past 1,000 years. And that person died in obscurity and death and they don't even know where his grave is. He's been forgotten and uh, God did that on purpose. Because he, that one man, has affected this world the most. Every aspect of society has been affected by that one man in the past 1,000 years, more than any other one person, they said. And does anyone know who that one man is? Who died in obscurity, died in death, and they don't even know where his grave is, and they forgot all about him. He had no fame, no nothing, and he died probably thinking his life was a failure. God allows, if you're a great man, God will allow that things like that to happen to you to keep you from getting what? Proud. Proud, that's right. And that's why God works uh, this way to help us. It says, love is not puffed up. It vaunteth not itself. Anyone know the name of that man? His first, he was in Germany, and uh, his first name was Johann. Okay, that great prince. Gutenberg. Johann Gutenberg. What did he do? Print press. He made the first printing press with movable type. And they used a press that they pressed olives and got olive oil out of the olives. They used that. And he put little metal things on there and made the first printed Bible that ever existed. And uh, it's, uh, but he died in obscurity no fame, no fortune, no nothing. And uh, God had it that way so he wouldn't lose his own soul by being puffed up. Love is not puffed up. Behave itself not unseemly. I'm going to read you something in a few minutes where people, especially religious people today, can uh, behave themselves unseemly. Laodiceans tend to be proud. They tend to be spiritually proud. And so they can, their minds can actually be imbalanced and feverish and excited and excitable and so they, the devil can deceive them and make them think I'm going to be a great that they're going to be a great person and be famous for some new thing 
some new idea they come up with, and you'll see in a minute that that's very dangerous. And uh, uh, But thank the Lord, when a person has the love of God, he's humble. He has that faith. It says, behaveth not unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. Are you easily provoked, friend? If somebody attacks you and curses you and accuses you of doing wrong constantly for an hour and a half, uh, would you be provoked? It says, it's not easily provoked. Look at Jesus. Was Jesus easily provoked? Oh, no. In Jesus, you see in a human form what love is. He was not easily provoked. They, they hit him in the face and slapped him and spit on him, jammed a big crown on his head, uh, thorns and blood ran down his face. They beat him and with it on his back uh, several times until his whole back was lacerated and blood was running down his face. And they were nailing uh, uh, spikes in his hands. And Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus was not easily provoked. Jesus is God. God is love. Love is not easily provoked. You're going to have to learn that before the time of trouble. Because if God sees that you're going to get provoked in the time of trouble, you won't make it to the time of trouble. God will see to it that you what? Die. That's right. You will die if God sees that you cannot go through the time of trouble without getting provoked, you will die. Is that kind of God to do that? Yes, it is. Well, how do I know that you will die? Because the Bible promises that God will not allow you to be tempted above that you are able, but with the temptation, provide a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. Now is the time to overcome all sin and prepare for that time, which is getting closer and closer. It says, uh, Rejoice is not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Beareth how much? All things. Love bears all things. Remember that. No matter how strong the temptation and trial get, love beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Love never what? Fails. fails. Praise the Lord. Prophecy fails. All these things fail. And tongues fail. Tongues cease. But love never fails. Now abides faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Praise the Lord. That's what us Laodiceans need. This faith that works by love and this love. And God will give it to us. Turn now in your Bible over to the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter 22. Psalm 22. And we're taking a look, studying really, in this book of Revelation chapter Three about Laodiceans and what we need to help us and what God will do to help us. <clears throat> in the Bible, um, I, I was planning to look it up before now, but, you know, I forgot to do it. Um, and so I'm going to look it up right now if I can. And if I can't find it real quick, I'll just forget about it. But there is a verse um, in the New Testament, and you, I know you've read it before. Here it tells about Revelation, and I believe this verse, yes, here it is right here. It's in Revelation 20, verse 11. I'm going to read this. <clears throat> and this is John talking. It says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face... The earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. What does that mean? Let me look at it. Let's look at it again. I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose faith, face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. So here's John in uh, Revelation 20:11, looking at God. And when he looks at God on his throne, heaven and earth flees away. What does that mean? It doesn't matter. That matters. That became his all in all. Yes. Yeah. If you were to look at God, for instance, if you look at anything, say I look at that light, do you think I can still see you out there while I'm looking at that light? What's the answer? 
The answer is yes. Yes, I can see you. They call it peripheral vision. Peripheral vision. When you get tested for driving, they check to see your peripheral vision. They have their hand way over here, and I can see my hands moving, even way over here on the side, peripheral vision. But if you were to look at God, you wouldn't have any peripheral vision. Uh, when he saw God, heaven and earth fled away. In other words, it was so bright that there was absolutely nothing to the side at all. Nothing. Everything fled away when he was looking at God. That's what it's talking about. Heaven and earth fled away. This is poetic language, but I know exactly what he means because you see the intense brightness and everything else is totally gone, uh, filled with the brightness of God and you see absolutely nothing else to the side at all. It has fled away. That's what we need to do with Jesus. Keep our eyes upon Him and everything else, like the song. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. So let's look at Him for a minute. Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Who is that talking it's Jesus. Psalm 22, 1. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime. This is telling how he feels. Why hast thou forsaken me? I cry in the daytime, and thou hearest not. And in the night season, and I'm not silent. But thou art holy, O oh thou, that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Isn't that amazing? Hanging on the cross of Calvary, forsaken by God and by man. He says, Oh thou, you've forsaken me. I cry and you don't hear me. But you are holy who inhabits the praises of Israel. Isn't that touching? To think of the praises of Israel at a time like that. When the weight of the sins of the world are upon you, and God himself is forsaking him and everything, he says, Oh thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Oh, it's something precious about praising God. God actually dwells in your praises. And if you have a sick mind or a sick body and you start praising God, God will dwell in your praises. And when a sick mind or a sick body got God dwelling in it, a healing process has bound to begin. Amen. He that hath the Son hath life. O thou that dwelleth, that inhabiteth the praises of Israel, all they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip and shake the head. He trusted in God, they say, that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was on my mother's breast. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. There's a lot of deep meaning in that verse. God taught me some of the deep meaning by what I went through one time. We were living in Tampa, Florida, and uh, we had to move out of one apartment into somewhere else. And we had two kitty cats, a mother and a little baby. And I had to take <coughs> those two little kitties to the animal shelter. It was one of the most hard things I've ever done. <laughs> now, you might say, that's ridiculous. That's not a hard thing. Just put them in a box, drive them there, take the box in there, goodbye, and you're gone. That's the end of it. Isn't that right? But that's not the way it was for me. That might be the way it was for you, but not for me. Uh, because the mother was afraid. And since the mother was afraid, the baby was afraid. Because everything the mother does, the baby learns from that, and so the baby sees the mother afraid, so the baby knows that he's supposed to be afraid too. So they were both afraid, and they got out of the box in the back seat, and the mother is actually clawed holes in the upholstery of the door, of the car door, holes there in the vinyl that she put there because she was afraid. And it was torture to my heart, believe me. I was being tortured probably more than they were, and it was hot there. And so I, uh, we got to the place, I parked in the parking lot, and my heart was just tearing to pieces. I didn't know what to do. And, and uh, so I went, ran in there. I didn't want to leave them in the car long because it's very hot. I ran in there, told them about it. They said, there's a cage. Bring him in, put him in that cage. I ran back out, opened the door, 
and somehow it was very difficult. I got them in the box. And I ran very gently, holding the box gently in there, opened the cage door, opened the box, and they both went into the cage. I closed the cage, and that was a relief. At least they were there. And uh, uh, the, uh, they were crying, uh, and um, I just didn't even pay any attention to the lady behind the desk at all. I was just focusing on them. I just stood there, my heart being ripped to pieces. And uh, because of their suffering, and there were strange people and strange noises in the background, their dogs were barking, and they were afraid and, and terrified, and my heart was being torn to pieces. And as I stood there watching, uh, after a little bit, the mother laid down. And guess what the baby started to do? It started to nurse its mother. Here it says, Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. And when a baby nurses its mother, it's in the very bosom of love itself. I don't know if there's any more tender relationship than that. Uh, how does a baby feel when it's nursing its mother? Absolute safety. There can be no danger when you're nursing your mother. Everything is all right when you're nursing your mother. Everything is all right. There can be no danger. You are an absolute surrounded by love itself. And uh, the baby laid there and now was peaceful, nursing its mother. But I knew that the baby was absolutely trusting in the very bosom of love and was felt totally safe. And I knew that it, I was giving it to its death. And that tore my heart to pieces. And I got out of there as soon as I could. And I went out in the car. And I broke off. And I cried. For not just, well, yes, because of them, but also in my mind, I felt the presence of God. And I needed something right then. And as soon as I drove out of that driving lot, parking lot, I looked up and there was a great big billboard. Somebody put up this big billboard. And I looked up and it said, my grace is sufficient for you. I said, oh, thank you. I needed that. And I drove off and I started crying because it taught me. I said, I saw that baby. I knew they were both being given up to their death, but in its own heart, it was in the very bosom of love itself. And it touched my heart so much, just like here Jesus on the cross, dying a hell death. He's tasting the sufferings of death, it says, for every man. Yet he says, Thou didst make me hope. When I was upon my mother's breast, I was cast upon thee from the womb. There's no way that love is going to let you down. Do you believe that? You trust a person, a baby nursing its mother, knows that there is no way that love is going to fail. Love is going to let it down. There's no way that love, there is no danger whatsoever. There's no way that love is going to allow anything when a baby is nursing its mother. And the fact that I was giving them over to their death uh, somehow pierced that love and brought into my mind the death in the bosom of infinite love. Love was leaving him to die, sacrifice for our sins. And that pierced my heart uh, more than probably I can put in words with the love of Jesus as well as other lessons as well as what was happening there. And so, verse 11, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. He's crying out to his father, yet he's going to die. Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. Here's the religious leaders. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is as wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws. Thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assemblies of wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments. 
among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling, from the power of the dog. He's crying out to his father who is about to murder him. You might say, why did you say that? Because who was it that murdered Jesus? Was it the Jews? Yes. Was it the Romans? Yes. Was it every sinner that's ever lived? Yes. Was it you that murdered Jesus? Yes. Was it the Father? Yes. Every person in this world has murdered Jesus. And but uh, it's like nursing its mother about ready to die. Verse 21, save me from the lion's mouth. For thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorn. Praise God, Abraham saw a substitute. He didn't plunge the knife into Isaac. There was found a substitute in that ram that represented Jesus, but there was found no body to take the place of Jesus. Jesus had to do it himself. And even his father, his darling as he called him, in the bosom of love itself, would not come and save him. Why? Because Jesus and God the Father loved you. God loved you. That's why he did it, friend. That's why Jesus died. He loves you. I heard of a man just the other day who was 80 years old and he felt that God can't love him. God can't save him because he's too bad. Oh, friend, let him look at the cross. Let him look at the cross of Calvary and hear and read these words and he will see that God's forgiveness is for him. God's forgiveness is for you, friend. If you'll only reach out your hand and take it, it's for you right now, right now. Amen. Jesus said, Thy sins be forgiven thee. Believe that. Latch hold of it. Friend, and it's yours, and your sins are gone. You have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ right now. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Here it says, uh, go on, I'm going to tell you, please, when you get home, when you get home, uh, read Psalm 22. Read the whole chapter and let it fill your mind and your heart. And then towards the end of the chapter, he actually starts praising God, constantly praising God. Verse 25, my praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They that praise the Lord shall seek him. Your heart will live forever. <laughs> praise God. Psalm 22. We see what love is. We see what love is. We see what judgment is. And justice. Justice and mercy kissed each other on the cross of Calvary to save you, friend, from eternal death. Jesus dies and you go free and live forever. I have a paper in my hand. At the top it says, The Judgment of the Living. The Judgment of the Living. Uh, somebody mentioned this topic to a friend of mine the other day. Have you heard anything about this subject lately? The Judgment of the, of the Living. Well, I'm going to read to you something from this paper. And uh, if you'd like to get a copy of this, just write to my office and send anything to help cover the cost. And we'll send you this, the judgment of the living. Has it already begun now? Uh, so here it says, this is a subject that God's humble people will not debate with anyone. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus never argued with anybody about anything. If you'll practice that in your home, it'll help you have a happy home. Never argue with your wife or your husband about anything. Uh, you can say, sweetheart, you're always right. <laughs> Wouldn't that sound nice? You might say, well, if you said that, you'd be a liar. No, you wouldn't. Not necessarily. Because you may be speaking in parables. Jesus told parables. And uh, his parables were not all, were always literally true. There was a truth beneath the surface that the Pharisees could not fathom because they're in their stiltified minds, they only wanted to see uh, truth right only on the surface. So Jesus spoke to them beneath the surface. And the common people heard him gladly. They knew exactly what he's talking about, even though his words were not literally true. But they knew exactly what he was talking about. But the Pharisees were looking, taking uh, only the surface meaning, and they didn't know what he was talking about. But Jesus was not a liar. 
He only spoke that way to get a message across. And uh, here it says, this is a subject that God's humble people will not debate with anyone. It says, if someone wants to debate it so that he can uh, pr promote some new thing or build himself up as great, all you need to do is just humbly smile and hand him his paper and let that do the work for you. Uh, it says, if he rants at the paper, the paper will be even more lowly and humble than you are. And the paper will not answer him back even a word. So I like to do that many times. If people want something, but you know they're, uh, they want to prove and, and build themselves up to be some great person, just hand them the answer on a piece of paper and let the paper do the work. That way it gets you out of the picture. Here it says, last night, a young man, a stranger to us all, but professing to be a brother from Victoria, Australia. This is Elder White talking, by the way. This is in uh, last day. It says this young man, a stranger, called upon them and asked to see Sister White, talking about herself. It says, it was evening, and I declined to see him. Uh, she was uh, pr providing for her health. If she didn't provide for her health, people would come to see her 24 hours a day, and she would lose her health and die, and then she couldn't help anybody. So she refused to see this young man uh, for the sake of her health, and maybe for other reasons. It says, we invited him to remain with us during the night, however, and to take breakfast. After our usual morning worship, as we were about to go to our various employments, this young man arose and with a commanding gesture uh, requested us to sit down. He said, uh, do you have any hymn books? We will sing a hymn, and then I have a message to give you. He commanded Ellen White and the family, sit down, we're going to sing a song, and then I have a message for you. How does that sound? Uh, it says, love suffereth long. Love is not puffed up. And you see, this young man uh, didn't know him, his own self. And so, uh, uh, then uh, Ellen White said, if you have a message, give it to us without delay, for we are very much pressed to get off the American mail, and we have no time to lose. He then began to read something he had written, which stated, among other things, that the judgment has now begun upon the living. I listened as he went on and finally said, quote, My brother, you are not exactly in your right mind. <laughs> but she did it in a very kind way. And uh, you are not exactly in your right mind. State plainly how your message concerns us. Please let us know at once. Your mind is overstrained. <laughs> Uh, you misapprehend your work. Much that you have said is in accordance with the Bible, and we believe every word of that. But you are overexcited. Please state what you have for us. Well, he said that we must pack up and move at once to Battle Creek. I asked his reasons, and he said, quote, The judgment has, become, has begun upon the living. I answered him, quote, the work which the Lord has given us to do is not yet finished. When our work here is completed, we are sure that the Lord will let us know that it is time to preach instead of teaching you our duty. I left him for Brother Starr to talk with further while I resumed my writing. She left and went back to her writing and left Brother Starr to talk with him. Says he, he told Brother Starr that when Sister White spoke to him so kindly, and yet, with such authority, he began to see that he had made a mistake. Wasn't that good that he admitted that? It says, and that his impressions, which had moved him so strongly, were not consistent or reasonable. Oh, and do you know there's many people today like this? Their minds are in the same excitable state as this dear man here. We received something from a person like that just the other day. And uh, in the same type of mind frame. Uh, and in Laodicea, that type of thing is very possible because people today know they're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. So it lends itself to this excitable type of thinking, an imbalanced way of thinking, if the devil can press a thing, especially if a person knows this is going to make me famous. 
I'm going to be singular because everyone will know that the name of John Smith is connected with this wonderful special message. And so it's a, a, a desire to be great that leads many times to things like this and uh, causes people to, to succumb to the tricks of the devil upon their own mind. Uh, here, he, uh, so Brother Starr talked with him. He admitted he made a mistake. He says, although our family is large, consisting of ten members, besides three visitors, we decided to have this young man stay with us for a time. Now that might seem very strange to you. You might say, well, I'd get rid of him as fast as I could. But she said, we decided to have him stay with us for a time. Here's the reason. It says, we dare not have him go with people who will treat him harshly and condemn him. Yes. Number one, they did it for his sake, because they knew people would just attack him as a weirdo and hurt him. And number two, neither do we want him to repeat his revelations and hurt other people with it. So it was for his sake and it was for the sake of others. They kept him at their own home for several days. And it says for a little time where we can associate with him and if possible lead him in safe, sure paths. So what they did, this shows love. Faith that works by love. And here an example of in the presence of a fanatic whose over mind is imbalanced and he's excited in all this teaching falsehood about saying that the judgment of the living has begun. They're very kind and very tender with him. They know that most all church members will attack him and destroy him. And they also know that he will imbalance somebody else. So they keep him away from all of them in their own home where he can be dealt with with kindness. I would say that's love, don't you think so? That's an example of the love us Laodiceans need. It's like giving to someone an arm uh, to, to help them. And, you know, it reminds me just yesterday morning before the sun came up, just yesterday morning about 3 o'clock in the morning, I had two dreams. And after I had these two dreams, I woke up and I thought about them. And I thought, well, these two dreams are connected with each other. And the first dream helps interpret the second dream. And so I got thinking about, them. do you want me to tell you what they are? Okay. Uh, in the first dream, I was walking down this hill. Now, of course, most dreams, you forget them because the Bible said, dreams come from the multitude of business, but fear God. So don't pay any attention to the weird, funny, uh, you know, dreams that you have. It's just from either eating before you go to bed, you'll have bad dreams from that, or some other thing, uh, your mind puts things together. But uh, in this particular dream, I was walking down this hill. It was a wooded area, uh, but there was grass and there was this path walking down this hill. And about halfway down, I was given this stone about this big and two or three other little stones that went with it. And on this stone, I looked at it, and there was a map on this stone. And I looked at this map, evidently telling me where I was going to be going. And then after I looked at it, I put the stone down with the two or three little ones in a certain place beside the path, and I kept going down the path. Well, when I got down to the bottom as far as I was going, I turned around and I started coming back up. On the way up the path, uh, I was joined by a friend of mine whom I had known for a long time, and I didn't see his face, I don't know who it is at all, uh, but I just knew and sensed in my mind that this is a friend that I've known for quite a while. And uh, this friend also had a book with him, and the higher we went up the hill, the bigger this book got. Also, uh, about uh, some ways up the hill, I felt a need, I guess, of seeing this map again, and so this friend handed me this stone, and these two or three other ones that looked just like the ones I looked at going down the hill. But when I looked at this stone, the map on it was all mixed up and jumbled up, and I couldn't make anything out of it and uh, at all. And so it didn't help me. And so finally I got back to the place where that original one was, and I put these down, and they looked exactly like the other ones. And then I saw on the first stone the, the true map, and that helped me. 
that taught me not to just take the word of God from somebody else, but study it for myself. Okay. Isn't that right? Don't just go by what somebody else says, the word of God says. Study it, take it, and study it for yourself. Amen. For instance, this publication somebody sent us, I looked at the first quote that said from so-and-so selected messages, page so-and-so, and it turned out that this person had made up his own words and put them in there and put quotation marks and then put selected messages after his own words that he made up. <laughs> Isn't that something? Now, if you don't know what the Word of God says and you're not real familiar, you'll take, you'll see these quotes and you'll see the reference and you'll take that to be true, like this stone that had jumbled stuff on it. Uh, if I, uh, you know what I mean. And so we, I was so familiar with the language and this language in this publication was not the, it was different than what Ellen White would say and, I, and, and so anyway, uh, this is one danger that people will, we will run into today. And so I uh, looked at this stone. So then we continued our way up the path and um, it was very strange because the higher we got up the path, the steeper this hill got. And it wasn't that way when I started out, but it is now. And it got steeper and steeper until finally I was having to put my hands, uh, you know, all four to keep, it was so steep, to keep from falling down. And it got steeper and steeper until I knew if I let go of my hands, I would just tumble right down. And I looked back, and it wasn't just a little ways. It was, seemed like a half a mile down there. It was like a great cliff. I'd fall off and down, be dashed to my death. If I let go of my hands and, and I was creeping along inch by inch and not only did it get steeper, this path got smoother and smoother, like and very smooth and the holds for my hands got fewer and fewer until I was just barely able to find a place and just an inch at a time until finally uh, near the top I noticed that at the top it was level but it didn't go like this, it was curved so I couldn't use my elbows to help me. It was so smooth and slick. I had to depend on my hands, a handhold. But there was, I came to the place, there was no more places to put my hands. My hands now were over the top of the level area, but I couldn't move. I couldn't move one more inch because if I took my hands off, I'd fall down. And there was no other place that I could feel to put my hands farther. And I knew that unless somebody helped me, I was doomed. I couldn't move. I couldn't go for anymore. And so my friend that was with me, somehow he got up on the top. And then he started trying to encourage me. He looked down at, as he was there and he said, Come on, you'll make it. You'll make it. Did his words help me sure. to make it? No, they didn't. Because I couldn't get any more holds for my fingers. I couldn't move. And I appreciated his words, but his words wouldn't help me any. He said, you'll make it, but I needed more than words right then. And so then he could see his words weren't helping me. And so then he took this book and he shoved it up right to, uh, near my chest. And he said, here. And I knew this was the solution that God gives in written form. This was the words of God, the counsel of God. And so did that help me get up there? I knew that if I let go and get, grabbed hold of this book, I would just fall right down off the cliff. And that would be the end of me. The, uh, me and the book would both go down. And so I knew that didn't help me either. I said, no. I said, give me your arm. Give me your arm. And so then he held his arm like this. And so I let go momentarily before I grabbed his arm, knowing that if there was nothing to that arm, I'm doomed and I'm going to fall off the cliff down to my death. I let go and I grabbed onto his hand and on his arm, and then there was a nice, strong pull, and I was able to get up off, uh, out of there, up to the top of that thing. Uh, that let me know that what we just read here, that the prophet gave a helping hand, his mind was imbalanced, he was excitable, he was confused, he was mixed up, he had falsehood. Yet, look at the kindness thing that the prophet and the people there gave. They gave them, him their arm, if you know what I mean. He gave him their arm and helped him. And uh, so this, this is what... Now, the rest of this paper tells about this subject, the judgment of the living. And... Uh, 
Uh, it tells what we're going to go through uh, in, in, in preparing for that. I have just a couple minutes I'm going to share with you, and then we're going to close. But look what we're going to go through uh, uh, concerning the judgment of the living before you are sealed, before your destiny is fixed forever and can never, never be changed. It says, I saw some with strong faith and agonizing cries, pleading with God. Now the time of trouble has come. The Sunday law has come. The death decree has come. Since their countenance were pale and marked with deep anxiety, expressed their internal struggle, firmness and great earnestness was expressed in their countenances. Large drops of perspiration fell from their foreheads. Uh, now, of course, the judgment of the living will come before the close of probation to the world. That's certainly true. Here he's talking about a time, it says, evil angels crowded around them, pressing darkness upon them to shut out Jesus from their view. Our only hope is to keep our eyes on Jesus. Amen. It says, as the praying ones continued, their earnest cries at a time, times a ray of light from Jesus came to penetrate the darkness, and their faces would light up. I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen, and was shown it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the lay of the sin. If you're a lay of the sin, and if you're in tune with God, time when God will move upon you to give a straight testimony, to tell the truth like it is, but with great tenderness and love, and that testimony itself will cause the shaking among God's people as well as the persecution. Those two things will bring it. It says, My attention was turned to the company I had seen who were mightily shaken. The company of guardian angels around them had been doubled, and they were clothed with an armor from their head to their foot. Would you like to have that armor? It's like Christian in the Pilgrim's Progress. He got this armor from head to foot. And uh, this will be a real armor, a spiritual armor. Uh, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the shield of faith, to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, the helmet of